Dr. Richard Hodge, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Howie Jacobson. It's always a pleasure having a conversation with you. Good, sir. Likewise, likewise. I'm excited for today. We're, we're diving deeper. We, were, we had a long conversation before we hit record, which is probably good that we, we didn't hit record for some of it. Um, but we, uh, we were talking about the, the idea of, of sort of complexity, that, that we're not talking in sort of sound bites and binaries. And so this is actually the second conversation in, in what's turning into a sort of series of, of uh, I, don't know, I think, maybe concentric spirals of, of meaning. That's a good way of looking at it, yes. Um, so today um, I want to dig deeper into, I think, the, the, the dragonfly framework. Right, and I see you, for those of you watching on, on YouTube, there are dragonflies adorning uh, well, your, back, yeah, your background. I'll, I'll just bring my camera backwards instead of forwards, and there they are sitting on the uh, uh, the back of my my door, and um, uh, and and they have a particular meaning uh, for me. I've taken them on very much as a as a totem, and um, many in the uh, First Nations peoples around the world will understand totems because just to pick up on your point of uh, complexity uh, Howie you know there's a deep entanglement and many First Nations people they, they don't just look at you know those binaries um, it's about how they relate to the land how they relate to their community how they relate to their ancestors how they relate to their elders how they relate to the air the water the the ancestral stories the dream time in the uh, Australian Aboriginal it, it all is part and parcel of the soul that they carry and the culture that they carry and the way in which they walk with the land and not just on the land so there's that deep entanglement um, that largely is missing in the, the Western the Western view and I think last week's conversation really was um, an example of that, that deep entanglement. Um, so how did we try to get out of or, or, or understand, you know, something clearer from that deep entanglement as to how we engage in the world? And I've suggested three things that we talked about last week. One, anchor on value. Know where you're centred on value and that we see the world um, entirely through that framework of value. It doesn't matter who we are, you know, we've all got our own way of perceiving the world that is then our view of that reality. Then that helps us understand what's relevant in that complex world for us to engage in it. And then, depending on how lightly we want to walk on this world, um, that when we'll think about the consequences, and again, the um, Aboriginal and, and First Nations people do that quite extensively, and that's what their elder system is about. Uh, but to help them understand all of that complexity, they realise they can't do it themselves. So they carry a totem. They're assigned at birth, and sometimes they'll pick up one or other. And it might be the kangaroo, for example. And um, then it become it behoves them, and it's their part of their community responsibility within their um, community to actually ensure that the world is well set up for the kangaroo, if that's their totem, or mm. for the echidna, or or what have you, so that they are part of um, the landscape and part of of the world, and and helping. Um, uh, understand the world from the kangaroo's perspective as well as creating a world in which the kangaroo can survive. Well, for me, the, the dragonfly has become a pretty useful totem um, and it's got seven elements, but more than anything else, it's what it symbolises, self-realisation. So, you know, self-realise that we're focus on value and that we get to create our own value framework. Transformation and new beginnings. And if that's what we really want, then it's the shift that we 
can create in the way in which we anchor on value, how we determine relevance, that will then create the sorts of consequences from our thinking and action that we want to see in the world. So mm -hmm. for, for me then, that, the, the, the dragonfly has uh, um, become you know, a wonderful totem. Yeah, I love that. And I just want to sort of respond to this idea of sort of embedding ourselves or entangling ourselves in the natural world. Um, so one influence of mine is I think Thomas Berry, who you know, a great writer on sort of the philosophy of life, said he grew up with the, near this pond or this, or this meadow, I think, like this, this beautiful meadow. And right. it had a huge impact on him as a child. And he said, like, the, what, what that left him with as he went out into the world is that meadow became his, his touchstone of value. Like, it, it, what, I, what I want to do now, does that enhance the resilience and biodiversity of that meadow or does it threaten it? And that, and that became his touchstone for, for everything. Do I buy this? Do I go here? Do I write this? Isn't that a beautiful example? And, and because it shows that, it, you know, it doesn't matter the size of the problem. He can find relevance within his own landscape for him to make the world a little bit better. Now, if you multiply that by 8 billion people on this world, now some of us have more opportunity than others to do more, um, but it's, it's within our grasp to do that, precisely. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm... Go ahead. No, no. Oh, well, what I was going to say was, just to, to finish off with the... or add a little bit more from the dragonfly, because it fits in with the competitive nature. You know, those, those who are from the rationalist school and the, you know, win-type nature, well, these dear dragonflies are the ace... I'm sorry, the apex predator and the ace predator are all around. And when you measure it by their success of killing their prey, capturing and killing their prey, in excess of 90% of, of uh, success in capturing and killing their prey. And the next most successful predator on the earth, not including people, is the African wild dog or, or the hy hyena and only because they hunt in packs. Hmm. So, but that's 60% working in packs versus 90% for these brilliant things working alone and, you know, using 80% of their um, cognitive capacity to sense the world through those huge eyes that they've got. So that, that whole notion then of how are we sensing the world and determining relevance um, brings it beautifully into focus. Hmm. And those, that 80% is perceiving the world as it is, um, it's, you know, as, opposed, as opposed to like human, our complex human brain that remembers things and overlays memories and expectations on the world where we might not be seeing much of it at all. Right. We might just be seeing our own projection of this looks dangerous or this reminds me of that. And, um, that's and we exactly lack... what we are doing. Um, that, that actually we... <laughs> who was it who said um, we don't see the world... Um, we don't... Uh, I'm not going to get it right. It's something to the effect of that um, we, we don't perceive the world we see, we see the world we perceive. Mm. We don't perceive the world we see, we see the world we perceive. So our perception shapes our interpretation of the world. Uh, well, I mean, you can see that in sort of the, the Western mind around we're disconnected. I'm, I am a, I'm a solitary being. <laughs> Right. That tr that tr I remember an exercise I did once and um, looking at a tree and saying like, OK, it's a tree. It's it's a it's an atomic. It's a unified thing separate from its environment. And yeah, it gets it interacts. And then the questions were like, you know, where do the roots end and the nutrients begin? Where does the respiration end? Where does the water end? And you realize after just a few seconds that the tree is nothing more than an eddy in a stream. It's a tr it's a tree shaped verb. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that I'm perceiving as a noun, uh, right. 
because of the way I was taught to perceive the world in atomic separation. Yeah, quite so. Um, and uh, uh, but we do that with all sorts of things, and then we complicate it by our own belief systems, the symbolization, that, the the symbology that we give to things. Um, so um, I, I think it really is then astute for us to you know come back to having a very clear understanding of of what our value our own value framework is and that if we want to tackle um, big problems then start with that appreciation of your own values um, because that will shape you change that anchor and it will change the way in which you perceive the world not just see the world mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like when I became a parent, all of a sudden, like, my definition of me grew. Right. It's like that little thing there that can't, you know, can't wipe itself is, is me. Like, I need to, you know, I, all of a sudden I have a greater sense of responsibility, a greater sense of vulnerability to the world and interactivity with the world. And there's no reason it should have stopped with my kids, it could have, you know, it could be my community, my faith community, my Frisbee team, my neighborhood, every, every living creature on the planet. Quite right? so. It's my choice where, where I stop being, where I stop the meanness and, and extend otherness. Yeah, I, I, I love that uh, uh, turn of phrase uh, because it really just uh, shifts to, well, um, it, it shifts the, your, your whole conception of um, meaning in the world, really. So what is it that you're doing then, you know, as soon as you become a parent? And I, I, I know my wife and I, now, <laughs> we became parents in 1978, so we're going back a fair time. <laughs> <laughs> and then again in 1980... Um, but we realized then um, uh, from, you know, our own uh, elders in our family saying, you've got this precious little bundle for such a short time, but it is your way of making the world better more than any other way because you will instantiate in these humans a value set that will set them for life. And so that when they're no longer yours, as it were, um, and that they are free at, illegally at 18 in this country um, to drink, to sign up for the armed forces, so on and so forth, and travel the world all by themselves, you can have confidence that they can go forward in their image but with a, a solid foundation of value, you know, and, uh, it, it, and, and you work towards that, you know, every little deviation and, and so on and the extent to which you, you learn to let them bring you up as well as you bring them mm -hmm. up. And, and that is really quite a challenge so that it, it, it again, um, and you don't realize this um, when you're first a parent as to the symbiosis in the relationship as to, yes, you're raising a child, but the child's also raising you. And and now I'm delighted to say that I count, um, you know, our two daughters and their husbands um, as our best friends, you know, and, and, and each of them have two children each and that, that's our unit of 10, mm -hmm. um, me, Vicky, and, and children and grandchildren and their husbands and that. It's, it's, and it's gold, right? So now we've gone from me as one to a partnership of two to um, a, 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 a small group of 10, um, and that's made quite a difference, right? So I think that, you know, we matter more than we think, which was one of the points from last week. There's, there's a perfect example uh, of that, and, and that that actually is enough. <laughs> As I become, you know, now an elder in the family <laughs> yeah. in a big way. <laughs> right, and, and yet our society, the, you know, the air we breathe and the water we swim in tells us that that's not where value is created. 
right? No, nobody paid my wife to take care of the children while I was out no. m- making a living. No one, right? It's almost like we look around and we, we look for like signs of, yeah. of, of worth and we don't get it from these things. We have to be reminded. We have to you know, hear stories about, you know, I remember Charles Eisenstein talking about Nelson Mandela's grandmother who stayed home in the little village and sort of raised him and, yeah. you know, had an influence greater than Kings because of the man she raised. And yet yeah. we have to be reminded of that because our, our, our value system, the overt public value system does not value things that, don't, that aren't somehow extractive or exploitative or, or, or somehow, you know, scribbling on the world with, with, with big markers. Um, yes, but. Oh, good. Yes, but. So, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, there, that's, that's one thing. Um, and I think a, a couple of points around that. Um, first, I notice in the younger generation, my, my grandchildren's generation, and there my youngest grandson will turn 17 next year, and then the eldest um, will be 24 um, in a month or two, and we've got four kids, four grandchildren within that range. They see the world somewhat differently um, to the way in which we were brought up, that they do want social change that you know, and a better world, and that they can see that it is indeed possible when, you know, um, if they can get through the disillusionment. But where I think there is hope in getting through that disillusionment is that others who have been previously disillusioned with those measurement systems, particularly, for example, um, gross domestic product, it's such a sledgehammer of a measure. Um, <laughs> that ignores all of the things that you're talking about that are so totally valuable in um, creating, uh, you know, being the the, the, um, creator of kings, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of work done on uh, a genuine progress indicator. And and, and that ties in a good deal with the modern uh, monetary theory uh, work from the likes of, you know, Stephanie Kelton and uh, uh, Mariana Mazzucato. Um, and, and it's wonderful to see the women in particular, economists, bringing these points of view forward because within the genuine progress indicator, the, the, um, there is recognition given to parents staying at home raising children because it's adding value to the social fabric and it can be counted mm-hmm. can it be compensated um it could be and in some I, I i don't know for sure but i wouldn't be surprised um if it isn't already being compensated in some of the particularly the the, the social uh, democracies um around the place of in europe in particular is where i'm thinking um, when you know you look at um, extensive maternity and paternity leaves uh, to begin with, um, and, and also the you know generous arrangements around some of their their working conditions that uh, uh, enable a far more flexible life that recognises a much more wholesome good, you know, hmm. and and people then will be able to do in four hours instead of attending for eight. You know, I'm going to say even Bertrand Russell wrote about that um, 60 or 70 years ago, you know, in Praise of Idleness was his essay and uh, and, and, and spoke to, you know, of, of how much there were ruling classes um, who were the idle and um, making money off the working classes who were being flogged at uh, anywhere from 10 to 14 hours a day. Um, in order to generate the income upon which the idle rich lay. Um, Now, if there's, you know, people in America listening to this, I can well imagine some going, yeah, but that's that's socialism. No, actually. In fact, I I was in a bookshop in um, a seaside town here, 
And I got on talking with the, the bookkeeper and the storekeeper. And I commented, I th said, I thought, uh, you know, as I'm aging, I'm becoming more and more socialist. She says, can I suggest another word? I said, certainly. She said, I think you're becoming humanist. <laughs> and, and, and that fits with where indeed, you know, the, the technology revolutions are, uh, are going, the, the industry revolutions um, is, is actually going to mass personalization where this whole issue of, and you can't do that if empathy isn't present. Right. So I, I, I think that there is a movement behind the scenes towards this. Hmm. And so I, 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 I have hope. I have hope. And I think we can crystallize it, which is where, you know, this this sort of uh, thinking aims to um, offer a perspective that might help people um, do that, that. You know, uh, Great. So, I, yeah, I would love to get into that because I look at my children in their 20s and I see them as very well intentioned carpenters looking to build the better world. And I yeah. see you as having tools that, <laughs> that can that can help them do that based on your understanding of systems, of patterns of history, of the sociology of, of human interaction. And yeah. the so the dragonfly we mentioned you know, yeah. it's some of its qualities, but it's all it's also a framework, right? A, a, a model. Can we uh, can yeah. we, can we uh, explore? Ab absolutely. Now, I'm going to um, just see if the technology will help me um, a, a, a little here. Um, Looking good there. Oh, there. There we go. So that's a, a framework of just four groups of what people might think of as well ways of framing questions um the, the, the sort of why questions um that actually help us um, explore uh meaning um the how questions that help us understand um process and the sort of skills and competencies that we need, but more importantly, how everything is connected, right? So meaning and how is connection. And then given your understanding of that, then what is the change that you would wish to make? And there's lots of what questions and what explorations that can be done. Now, that's all very conceptual until you come to the if statements that take bits of the what and go, well, if we do that, will it deliver the meaning that we set out to achieve? So quickly we learn then that there's a set of relationships amongst these groups of explorations, right? That um, why le leads you to gaining broader perspectives as to why a particular initiative or or why something is problematic that you want to change, how that issue then is connected to the whole. So if you really wanted to have a um, a, an indigenous like exploration of the, the different dimensions of the community, um, you could do that through the how exploration. And then ideally working with the people, co-create what you would change so that you're not breaking the essence of what is, but actually adding value that you're seeking to, to drive and then come back to the if. And, and so you can see how it sets up a it, 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 pretty much an infinity loop of how you can go round and round on this various uh, question set. Mm -hmm. And it really helps us build resilience to um, uh, resistance that... Uh, um, and just to complete the model so that I can then come back to you, here's where those three things we were talking about last week sit. Can, can you make it bigger? It's... Uh... Uh, to do that. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. 
So just yeah. just a note for listeners that um, the the YouTube the video of this conversation includes visuals. Ah. <laughs> There we go. Uh, yes, um, the the combination of different applications wants to draw it off uh, off the screen uh, somewhat, so that I'm I'm unable to um, shift it from where it is. But um, uh, unless perhaps if I hold it over like that, yeah, it's looking good um, to me now. All right, I'll 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 hold it still. Uh, <laughs> there. Well, dragonflies um, hover, right? They're, they're, well, they do indeed. Um, in fact, they do everything on the wing. But you can see that those explorations from why to how to what to if and back to see if what you do achieves what you set out to do. And then uh, often you've still got work to do. So you go back into the how and do another loop. It's all anchored on the value. Are you actually delivering the value that you set out to do? And, and that that value helps you uh, realize what is relevant in the world for the change that you're seeking to make. And when you're looking at the, the what and the how, you're realizing relevance in, becoming, in the sense of becoming aware. You realize that something is important and that it needs to be considered. And then after you've done the work in co-creating that change, you make it real and realize it into the real world if you take certain actions and evaluate it against what you set out to do. But in that, you know, the flip side of value is that whatever you do, whatever you think, will have consequences. It may well influence the wrong people. It may well um, uh, have... Uh, catastrophic consequences if all you're seeking to do in your value model is um, extract gold from a mine and you don't give a damn about the cyanide poisoning or or whatever else that that might go on now there's rules and regulations around that but not in not in every part of the world and we we, we see quite a lot of um, ill-founded consequences um, from from that work so that that then gives us the the seven basic elements of the dragonfly, um, but constantly cycling through those four groups of considerations of why, how, what, and if. Hmm. So does that um, help give you um, a, a, a bit of the the, the considerations um, uh, uh, around that? Because from that, um, each, each of those elements really help us then focus on some key questions. So, before, yeah, before, before we go on, I have a, uh, a question, so, something you said that almost by, passed me by, and then I sort of started chasing after it a little bit and, and wanted to yep. explore it with you, is when you said um, that when we collaborate and we do the, the, the um, you know, the what with uh, bringing other people in, we don't break the essence of what is. And that sounds very anti-revolutionary <laughs> in, in terms of revolution as in, you know, down with the old, up with the new. And I'm, cu I'm curious if I, if, if I'm interpreting that correctly, that, 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 that you, you would, much prefer evolution to revolution? Uh, yes, um, because you cannot predict emergence, right? You cannot predict emergence. So the best we can do as we cycle through this um, is work out what is our next best step and then see what happens. And if the action we take has consequences that are consistent with the value in the head of the model, good. Then you can go, well, what if we did a bit more of that? Boom. Um, and, and depending on who's taking action and the what, you know, you're not going to know the ripple effects through the entangled complexity of today's society. 
um, which is a, 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 a you know politico socio technical um, mess, and that is a technical term. Actually, calling it a, a, a mess. What does that mean? As a technical term. Uh, well, it, well <laughs> that I'm not just being um, a, a flippant in in calling you know the world a mess as it is. That the, the uh, complex world um, uh, you know are full of messy problems. Mm. And and now David Snowden prefers the word word of entanglement. That there is an entanglement in there, and it's worse than a bowl of spaghetti because you know you can pull it and not necessarily. Um, know where the end is or what the ripple effects are of your pulling on any one thread in the world. So therefore, you know, take small steps frequently um, and, and understand as you go through that infinity loop of really understanding why you're seeking to do something, intervene in the world, and that'll be driven by your value model how the world is connected so for example in the if you were going to make an intervention into a um, first nations community and you go in there having you know engineered a solution in a place or oh, let's say like canberra I think australia's capital city which is a long way from um, uh, outback australia and um, and you arrive at a First Nations community and you go, now nah, we've got the answer, here you go, and implement it and then find it doesn't work. Simply because you haven't thought about how their entire way of working is so different to the Western way of thinking and acting and behaving. And, and that you have to understand that they're deeply connected to the land. They're deeply connected to um, ancestors, to dream time, to the, the story that, that drives their community and, in fact, is their, the set of stories that is a, a governing um, the behaviour in the community. So, and there's a deep entanglement in that. So, and, and, and that is true for our world, even though we pretend it's not. So, so what, what does the, the dragonfly model morph into when we do it the way we've, you know, we do it in the West without, without humility? Uh, so right, so there's, there, it's, it, does, it starts with the why, like we want to get something done. What, yes. what does that look like? Well, it flips to the what, right? We don't even think about how it's connected to the community. We just go, boom, um, what do we want? What do we think is the best answer? How then are we going to physically instantiate that? And then if we do that, how will we test and evaluate to make sure that um, it meets the requirements that we set out in the first place? So it goes round in a mm. circle rather than in an infinity loop and um and my dear old you know profession of systems engineering all you systems engineers out there yeah you know you can be guilty as charged because we uh, you know it is an archetypal rationalist methodology of going well why do we need change then do some form of requirements analysis that says, well, what are you going to change functionally? Then how are you physically going to do that? And as though the community was a black box. And then how are you going to test and evaluate that to see whether or not you met the requirements that you yourself set? And... Tyson Yunker Porter is a um, an Aboriginal uh, researcher, and he's setting doing up quite a lot of work with uh, Canadian First Nations people as well, looking at indigenous knowledge systems, which is quite fascinating. But he tells a story of how um, one of his elders he refers to as Mama Doris. 
And Mama Doris has experienced this way of Western thought and Western intervention for over 50 years. And she says that, they, you know, the Westerners, it's, they come with good intent, but they get it precisely wrong every time for 50 years because they've done their thinking and they come in and direct a solution. And when it goes wrong, only then do they reflect on what went wrong. And as they work to understand that with community, they learn how the community is connected. And for all of those things that I've talked about before, and then they so deeply understand why that went wrong, then they leave with respect. Mm -hmm. And she said, if only they would do it in the reverse order. So they typically come in, direct a solution, reflect on why it goes wrong, connect with community, and then leave with respect. Start with respect. Understand how the community is connected. Then work with the community to reflect on what change is practical. And um, direct and, and create uh, ways of working that almost enable the community to self-direct and not be directed. And then actually that builds respect and adds to the respect so it gets the infinity loop going. So it, it really is crucial that um, we get away from these yeah, I, I can draw it in a circular pattern, but largely it's linear thinking. Mm, yeah. Um, so what, what are some examples uh, that are not sort of like big political issues or social solutions, but sort of, could, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this is, this is uh, relevant to everyday life, like whether I want to shift my family, have a new job, change you know, my eating habits, almost almost anything, there, everything's embedded in complex systems. And on and my notes for, for this conversation, you talked about the importance of finding a, the will to transform, to, it's almost, you know, we, we could think of in terms of risk-benefit analysis, but really in terms of emotional courage. Um, so I'm wondering if we can bring this to, you know, to the, pro, the, the issues that listeners and myself face on a day-to-day -day basis, even if we're not overtly saying, I want to change the world? Well, um, you start with yourself, even if you do want to change the world. But, you know, and, and how you do anything is one thing is how you do everything is, you know, some of the other aphorisms uh, around. But if you want to change um, eating habits, uh, uh, for example, well, then you can why what's changed in your value proposition in your value your framework of value that's forced mm -hmm. you to think about that all right so i ha i just gotten a diagnosis um right so someone i know just had a heart attack um i saw a documentary about factory farming um yes. i i got ready for beach season and I looked in the mirror, right? These <laughs> <laughs> and these, these are the very real uh, uh, things. And, um, but that then enables you to create a shift that you're now putting more value, for example, on your health. Mm -hmm. and, and for whatever reason, you've been you know, spending a lot of time, as I did when I was younger, chasing the company goals and it took me 30 years to realize that the companies wouldn't love me back. Um, so there, there was a shift in my value proposition that forced me then to look more uh, uh, inwardly about, you know, my own value and, and how I wanted to maintain a healthy mind, body and soul. So I think that each of us do that first in, in looking at what's shifted in our own way in which we're looking at the world and interacting with it through our value framework. Then that gives you the first bit in the why. So why now do you want to focus on, you know, the, the um, health and or, or you know, eating habits? Um, and 
because you've noticed that perhaps you're not exercising uh, uh, as much. I'm talking more about me, that I'm not exercising as much as I used to. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm uh, seeking to reduce is my caffeine input. Mm. Why? Again, um, and you mention it, you know, um, a mate of mine who was only two years older than me, you know, and he appeared fit as a fiddle, died of a heart attack one week after his 70th birthday. Mm. And you go, crikey. Um, uh, you know, so therefore that gives the meaning as to what is the shift that I want to then focus on in reducing my caffeine input, being more conscious of what a, how I fuel my body um, in, in order and exercise it. Now, how do I want to do that in a way that isn't going to disrupt the things that are absolutely important to me? And I, when I look at how everything is connected, I'm driven by three main priorities in my life. One, my relationship with my wife. I say not my wife, my relationship with my wife. Two, my relationship with my children and my grandchildren. And three, my relationship with my work. Now, is anything I'm going to do about that going to interfere with those relationships? Well, certainly... Um, in terms of how we um, uh, plan family meals, then there's going to be some conversations had and done in a way that doesn't, you know, that actually adds value to that relationship um, uh, around that. And then I can talk with Vicky, since mostly just her and I living at home uh, these days, um, and say, well, look, what's our menu plan going to be for the week? You know, and we co-create that. I'm not imposing on her, mm -hmm. you know, a life of celery and uh, and, and sparkling water, um, <laughs> because we, you know, we, you only want to cook one meal, not 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 two. Um, and then, um, if we make those changes in our life, then we will get some feedback as we evaluate that. And lo and behold, here the technology comes in. And earlier last week, I got a little message on my little Apple Watch going, oh, there's been a change in your health status. Oh, shit, you know, it doesn't tell you exactly what immediately. But I find that my basic heart rate had been lowered by eight points over the last uh, four weeks. And I go... There's a bit of feedback. So there is one loop mm -hmm. of that that um, and, and it's had consequences. Now, is that going to add to my life or whatever? I don't know. But the consequences are so that I feel healthier. And it's it's added to um, and reinforced that shift in my value framework. Mm. And I, I, you know, I love the the humility that's just inherent in taking things iteratively, looking at like, where, where are the, the chances for unintended consequences, right? Because most of the conversations about caffeine or, or celery aren't about caffeine or celery, right? Yeah. They're about who am I? Who are you? Am I all of a sudden better than you? Are we still going to sit together in the morning or... <laughs> right. Like so. So there are, you know, to be to be open to kind of the, the layers of meaning, which I think is where you said, you know, how can we enhance the relationship rather than like, OK, I've got, you know, I've put I've invested in the relationship so that I can make a withdrawal <laughs> to make things slightly worse. Right. As opposed to how can this conversation act? How can right the 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 higher level value of this relationship be enhanced even as I want to enhance it through maybe living longer and better. That's right. You know, and that um, it, it, we're really the complexity mostly is borne by people, right? That, that we are each of us having several different roles in life and that sometimes those roles rub up against each other as um, we live together or that we work together or that we do both. And in my wife and I's case, we're, we're both directors of our, you know, the, our, our company. And, um, and so we live, work and play um, 
together in everything so that 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 relationship is is absolutely vital but i think that's vital for everyone to look at uh, uh complexity through that human lens and uh and and then ask less um well, in fact, it was oh, just at the last um, uh, systems engineering conference in Dublin uh, in July, or at the beginning of this month, Professor Catherine Cormican talked about um, Industry 5.0 and how that, you know, whereas Industry 4.0 was all about automation, heavy technology focus and all of that, Industry 5.0 is more about mass personalization and, and that bringing the human and the robotics uh, elements um, in, in harmony and the need for empathy. But she turned things on their head, whereas previously we would look at technology and then um, how that then shifted into products that created enabled experiences and from which we drew meaning. Well, actually, we need to turn that on its head and go, but what is the meaning that we're seeking to uh, 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 shift what, and find or create? What's the experiences that um, enable that? Then the products that will be useful in that experience that will then dictate what technologies need to be developed. And so it, it neatly turns it on its head um, and then fits with the model that we've, we've just been talking about um, in, in terms of why, you know, that you start with why, that's the meaning piece. And then how it connects into our experience base, some of which we actually want to retain because, you know, life's beautiful and there's still a lot of truth and goodness in it. Co-create the what that might be some form of product or technology. And then if it, that um, is, is applied as a whole, whether or not that actually delivers the meaning that we had hoped for in the first place. Mm. What's just so a nice inversion. Yeah, what that reminds me of. I don't know. Do, do you know, do you ever watch uh, Rory Sutherland's TED Talk? I I haven't. No. So he he's a a British marketing guy, and he was talking about like you know okay so marketing has reached sort of the end of its rope in terms of like more things, you know everyone needs more things to be happy. We have too many things. So for most people who are not in the you know the poverty end of the spectrum. More th and he uses the example of how the UK and France spent $20 billion to, imp to make the channel tunnel faster right. because the journey was like six hours. This is, you know, $20, $20 billion took this many years. It took, you know, it, it says the, so what was the problem was it wasn't fast enough. So that's the problem they tried to solve. He says the problem was people weren't enjoying the journey. He said for $20 billion, if you had supermodels serving champagne, <laughs> right? It, it reminds me actually of a, a, a similar, um, the, the foible of humanities, you know, of, of, of us humans, that um, in many um, high-rise apartments, lifts never arrive fast enough. Mm. Right. And and it's because people weren't enjoying their time waiting for the lift. So they put more mirrors in. <laughs> right? And in the hotels, then people, they, the more mirrors they put in, the less people complained. <laughs> right. And because you can go and oh, no, all right. Yeah, I'm getting ready. Am I? Yeah, I think I'm ready to actually go downstairs and, uh, and meet the boss and boom. Bingo, hmm. you know the, the the complaints dropped off, and and you're, you're you're exactly right with regard to the um, you know channel experience of uh, yeah, well people just weren't enjoying the journey. Yeah, hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, so so you talked about the the will to transform. 
right? Yeah. That the, the, from from the from from one side of the of the journey, the uh, the infinity loop, it looks like it's gonna it's scary, right? So that we and even you know it might be, it might be very, it might not be. We might end up much better off than we are now. But there are certain there are certain there are certain things we have to sacrifice. Right or perceived to have to sacrifice in order to get on that infinity loop, and I wonder if you could could talk about that. Well, I, I I'll come back. There's a couple of things I think I'd like to say, and it's it's a a, a perfect question, uh, uh, Howie, that as people are looking at this model of the why if. Uh, what and how they are colored differently that um, the what and the how relate very much to our the concepts that we hold they're conceptual we ha are aware that change is necessary we can become aware of what change will be relevant but until we go from awareness of change to actually the other form of realizing relevance, and that is making that not only relevant but real in the world, then what we end up with is almost like a, 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 a great void between the conceptual and the doing. And, and, and that's often known as um, the knowing-doing gap. And and it's it's a well known it's a well known thing. There's a um, uh, a recent article last year in Harvard Business Review, and um, I'll I'll dig it out for you. I can't remember the exact uh, title uh, right now, but it goes to the point that. There could be all sorts of reasons why people, even though they're aware that the change is good, are fearful of making any change. Um, or certain people seeing <coughs> a, <coughs> excuse me, a loss of humanity in the world, but are fearful of saying anything about it, <coughs> of popping their head up over the, the precipice. <coughs> Sorry, I've just got that. <coughs> all right, take it. Spot in the back of my throat. Take care of yourself. Um, well, this is all. This is all editable. <laughs> Good. So it's it's that that knowing doing gap, and it's often driven by fear. <coughs> Excuse me, which is particularly born if there's just you know you and me thinking that this is a good idea, right? And that maybe we have sequestered ourselves away and we've gone, oh, all right, now, and we know it's bloody good, but how are we actually going to take that to anywhere else? Well, the thing is, is how then do you um, build a coalition of the willing? And that even doing that, is you know so can you test it with friends who might say no look um the climate's not right for that yet um or that technically i can see this problem or socially i can see this problem in your stepping forward and and the more of those sorts of conversations you can have and then not present the solution but rather shift the conversation back to the why why is the current situation problematic? Mm. And how do we want our way of living together improved without destroying what is working and good right now? Mm. And when you can have those conversations, then they will help create the what. And that helps close the knowing doing gap. Um, and and it's more art than science. Boy, it, this reminds me so much of a process that I'll use as a as a coach when I'm I'm working with someone who has okay something they want to accomplish, and then 
they exhibit what we will call resistance. Yes. Right. And as a coach, I was trained to kind of help them blast through the resistance. And as, as an, uh, someone who's approaching elderhood, <laughs> I've discovered that the, the thing to do is to put the resistance in the Y square. <laughs> Yeah. And say, OK, <laughs> rather than, OK, so we wanted to change because, you know, you you weren't happy with this now. OK, but I'm not making the change. I'm still going out for junk food. I you know, I I'm resistant. And so now we look at great. What is let's take the why what's going on as a, instead of calling it resistance? Like what's the knowing that yeah. that this change is untenable or will lead to greater suffering? And it's it's such a much more respectful way of dealing with people rather than just calling something a pathology or an obstacle and wanting to right. to you know blast blast it away. <clears throat> so it it does pay, and it's like coming back to the the indigenous example, you know, um, of of entering it with respect, and and that means giving that person respect because there's you know probably good reason in their mind as to why they are. Um, you know, not on the same plane as you for, you know, that particular uh, that particular issue. And um, and and often people love talking about the problems. They also like talking about their aspirations. And um, and, and that's where, you know, the, the respect and really understanding grounds for common shared meaning. Um, and when that happens, then you can come back to the how and say, but this isn't going to affect the relationship between um, you and your boss. You know, if anything, it's actually going to strengthen it if there's a good reason for that, you know. And, and you can begin to look at the things that are actual currencies for them beyond money, time, um, happiness and status you know those it's worth exploring all four of those currencies and seeing just what might shift and then it, it it's not so scary i go well actually you know if we went with this i you know stand a chance of um, improving my status in the executive's eyes and and that would do my aspirations for becoming an executive, you know, um, so much the better. And, and, and it's just about finding those currencies without disrupting too much, holding respect for people and for their connection with the family, with the business, with other relationships, and then co-creating the what, you know, what's actually... But, Typically, we want to drive straight to solution and 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 not deal with this other stuff that is much softer, but yet goes to the limbic brain. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what I was thinking of is when you were talking about, you know, the knowing doing gap being sort of, you know, fear as, as an element of it. I see a lot where fear leads to the need for drastic solutions. Right. Like, oh, things are so like, you know, the example of someone who gets told by their doctor, if you don't change tomorrow, your heart's going to, you know, like, OK, so there's a good reason to do a total shift for most people most of the time or yes. for the for the society at large. The feeling like I, I, I sort of feel revolutionary a lot, like let's just tear this whole, you know, pile of shit down and build something new. And I can recognize now that it really is fear driven. They realize yeah. like, oh, things are so urgent, things are so bad, or I don't, you know, I want to make a living as a trainer, consultant, coach, but the companies that would pay me the money that I want, I don't want to work for them because they're, you know, eating the earth. And, and it, it, all, it all becomes very uh, paralyzing. The, yes. the, the fear makes me want to either not do anything or do something so drastic that it will have no effect whatsoever. Well, I think it comes back to patience, being prepared to have that long journey through the tunnel as long as you're enjoying the process of seeing and getting a sense of progress. There was a, a thought leader, um, a good friend of mine, Dr. Jason Fox, um, who wrote um, a book, uh, How to Lead a Quest. 
and he talks a lot about progress and the importance of progress um, and saying that even you know getting a sense of progress is invaluable to making progress so that um, and and that almost goes back to you know the earlier part in our conversation when we were talking about the genuine progress indicator you know and the value of um, you know mothers by choice um, or circumstance staying at home to look after their children and that for feel, feeling that society doesn't value that as a, 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 an occupation at all when indeed it is the potential to um, actually improve the world one human at a time or one family at a time mm. um, and, and, and that when it's looked at from a different currency uh, then progress is quite visible. Mm. Mm. So patience takes, patience takes faith, right? And, and I'm hearing that, that progress bits, you know, um, glimmers maybe, uh, is, is what can, can replenish the I love faith. that idea of glimmers. Uh -huh. You know, and, and that, that you get a, a glimmer of, uh, that people start using different words or they start talking and picking up some of the vocabulary that you're using because, you know, you, you, you talk about how to get a shift and using the language of that. And then when you find, no matter, you know, because sometimes I've said, well, look, um, I've tried to explain this change and I've sort of run out of words. Let me see if I can try and explain it differently. And then you try that different set of words and then you go, all oh, right, OK. And but within, I don't know, a, a period of time. And I was thinking in that particular example of a large strategic uh, planning um, transformation that I was uh, leading actually had people coming back after a month or so using language to justify their using language I had used to justify the position they now wanted to take. And you go, there's a glimmer that we're actually getting a shift, mm. you know, and, and, and then um, you, it begins to, you know, like um, the snowball effect and, and that it, it does start to s slowly build from that. But if you think about um, viral change, it, it's all, you know, Anything exponential, it's gradual, 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 gradual. Suddenly, bang, mm. you've got change. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. What what came up for me there is um, sort of the resistance to the gradual. I've seen it so many times because it seems like the gradual is is not real, and it's getting in the way of the. The whole. So, for example, you know, I've been part of sort of the plant-based and vegan movement. I went to a conference, and a guy was talking about how stupid meatless Mondays are because it's one twenty-first of your of, of your or one seventh of your life, and look at climate change and look at cow fart emissions, and it's just a waste of time. And then, you know, when I back in 2016, I was a Bernie guy and felt so betrayed by the Democratic Party for not nominating Bernie. And it was very hard for me to appreciate that Bernie had really influenced the platform around so many things, around you know, the, the value of labor, around... And he continues to do so, and so many of the younger generation are listening. Okay. And another, you know, another example is um, a friend of mine who's been on the podcast, Micah Hendler, founded the Jerusalem Youth Choir which is, you know, Jews and Muslims, Israelis, Palestinians singing together. And yeah. it's beautiful. And particularly in um, the parts of the Palestinian community, it feels like collaboration or giving a, you know, um, peace wa pink washing or peace washing the struggle. And, and I, to I totally can kind of understand both points of view. And there's on days when I'm afraid, <laughs> when that's sort of the dominant emotion, it seems like, you know, love is not the answer. And then on other days, I'm like, love is the only answer. Love is the only answer. 
Um, but I, I think that that is there's a faith movement around that. Or, or uh, uh, if you've spoken with Christopher Miller, um, then you'll be into the joy of finding fish, you know, fulfillment, inspiration, success and, and happiness. And, and Christopher's message is very strongly centered on love is the only answer. But, you know, so, so too was John Lennon. Um, uh, and, and that's not to take anything away from what Christopher's saying either. Um, but I think that's, that comes back to what's in, what, what is, anchors you, what anchors you. And if love is a very strong noun and verb in the way in you, which you set your value proposition, then you're going to, then you're going to live with it. And, and with love comes patience. Right. Um, because you know, go back to the, the little baby, you know, you've got to be 18 years before that's a registered adult um, legal to, um, you know, um, inherit the, the earth, as it were, and, and, and go for. Hmm. Uh, so it, it, it is a patient game, but it's also uh, a game of constant reinforcement. Right. The sun comes up every day, boom, and gives us energy. Um, and we've got to get up every day and give what we believe in energy that it needs. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for a mic drop right there. Is there, is there <laughs> so, so, something more that you want to add to this conversation that uh, I haven't yet elicited? No, look, I, I, I think... Um, Maybe the, 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 the last word goes um, back to the, the, the dragonfly and that they do absolutely everything on the wing, um, from hunting to mating to um, uh, eating. Um, and, and so this whole idea uh, you often hear in corporates of, you know, where we're uh, building the plane while we're flying it. Well, actually, dragonflies are doing that all the time. <laughs> but here's the thing. Dragonflies spend 80% of their life as a nymph in water, which means that at some point in time, they've got to leave the comfort of what they know and climb out on a stick and hang on. And then be patient while transformation takes place and they have their wings and then can fly and be the dragonfly. So I think that there is a metaphor there for each and every one of us that feels somewhat disillusioned. Well, are you hanging on to the comfort of your current environment or is there something that you really want to hang on to and have the will to change and shift, then you need to give that time for you to find the words, the thinking, and the action that will then drive you to transform from nymph as you are to dragonfly as your possibility. I love it. I love it. <laughs> one, one, one of the things I have to do after the, each of these conversations is come up with a title. And right, the, the title keeps growing. It's got all these words, <laughs> love, patience, transformation, dragonfly. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's already too many, too many letters for YouTube. So I'll, I'll have to, uh, <laughs> to, to, um, to focus on, on something in particular. But Richard, thank you so much for... It's been a joy, Howie. And uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, I think, continue this, right? If you're, if you're willing, um, the, with different mo models and the how, if, why, then, uh, why, what framework. That's certainly something that we haven't touched on that is possible. Um, that um, around that why, what, how, if, you can indeed create some very simple models on one sheet of paper that enable you to guide a conversation through that. Oh, well, if you're, if you're willing to share trade secrets, I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> all right, but we'll have to get the technology working for sure so that I can um, properly share this screen. Excellent. Excellent. All right.
Take care, Richard. Thank, Thank you so much. Cheers, Harry.